We are so close to summer, and we are also so close to hurricane season here. I'm meteorologist Joe Martucci. Hurricane season, something we always have to watch out here at the Jersey Shore. Last year at the shore, we ended up pretty okay, uh, but we did have Ida in the remnants of Ida, which did bring, unfortunately, around 30 deaths to the state with tremendous flooding on the last day of August. For this year, we're going to talk to Dan Kotlowski. He's with AccuWeather. He's been with AccuWeather since 1976, longer than I've been alive. He knows his stuff. He has his hurricane forecast. So we're going to talk to him about what AccuWeather is saying, what he's saying, what to expect in New Jersey, and a lot about his illustrious career at AccuWeather and growing up in Indiana. Without further ado, we'll get on over to the podcast here. Thanks a lot, everybody, for listening, and we'll talk to you on the other side. talk about everything hurricane season long time accuweather forecaster i mean he's probably an accuweather legend I, I would say uh we have dan kotlowski here um dan it's a pleasure to talk to you um it's our first time talking um you know we, we'll talk about everything in your career in a little bit but it, it's really a pleasure to be with you here today dan Th thanks so much oh thanks for inviting me this sounds exciting yeah, yeah, it'll be exciting uh, half hour. We got plenty of things to talk about. We got your New Jersey map too. We've already gotten some thumbs up from people at our friends from Stockton. So I'm looking forward to that part. But uh, let's talk about hurricane season. AccuWeather released their hurricane forecast as they do every year. You are um, really one of the main people, if not the main person for it. You know, we had, and I'm, I'm just reading off of your forecast here, 16 to 20 named storms, that's tropical storms and hurricanes. Out of those 16 to 20, six to eight are hurricanes, three to five major hurricanes. Those are your category three, four, and five. And then also four to six that directly impact the United States. Now, looking at the averages, um, it is above average for named storms. And then we're in that average range, I'll say, for hurricanes and major hurricanes and an above average for direct U.S. impact. So that was a lot of numbers I threw at you there. Uh, in short, we're looking at a, we'll say, near to above average season. So, so far, so good, right, Dan? We, we're spot on with that? Exactly. And, and and the other thing, the other parameter we use sometimes, as you've seen, is uh, is what is called ACE, accumulated yeah. cyclone energy. Uh, we're expecting that to be probably somewhere uh, around 145 to maybe even close to 150. Uh, so um, that puts the intensity, the length of storm activity, and uh, the uh, time in which a storm has actually lasted in the Atlantic Basin. So uh, all the when you when you crunch the numbers, it looks like an above normal season. In fact, it almost looks similar to last year. Yeah, and, and, and last year we were above average uh, on most accounts here, 21 named storms. So we got to the very end of the alphabet, the hurricane alphabet, and then we stopped there. Thank goodness. Um, we had seven hurricanes, average is seven, so we were spot on there. Major hurricanes were four and eight, made direct impacts. You know, um, when you look at, at this hurricane season, um, something else that, that's, that's interesting to me is we've had seven years in a row with a system in the month of May. Any thoughts mm -hmm. on that? Yeah, I think, uh, again, that's, that's really... Uh the result of, of uh, the water temperatures being so warm. Right now, we have very warm water in place already in, in the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, even just east of, the, uh, east of the Bahamas, water temperatures are warm enough even now that if we were to get a weather pattern setting up, like a stalled frontal system and an area of low pressure uh, spinning up down there, certainly would not be impossible for even uh, something to spin up as early as sometime you know, later this month or early May. Um, but it's all because of the water temperature that's in place. Another factor that is also in play here is the fact we are still in a, a what is called a La Nina pattern. Water temperatures south of Hawaii are, uh, are uh, cooler than normal. And what that does is that causes the westerly winds across the U.S. 
and across Mexico to be more west to east and not dip down into the tropics nearly as much. And so that creates opportunity, early season opportunity for lower vertical wind shear. And when it simply means that uh, it won't be something to rip the tops of thunderstorms off uh, storms developing or trying to develop in the, in the tropics. So yeah. we're still in that same kind of environment as we have been for the last seven years. Yeah. And, and great way to describe wind shear too, ripping the thunderstorms off. That, I, I like that one. Um, <laughs> we're we're going to talk more about the whys, you know, into this hurricane season a little bit, but I, I want to talk about you here for a while because you have been, if, correct me if I'm wrong, you graduated from uh, Purdue, right? And then you went to AccuWeather and you haven't left. You've been there for since what, 1976? That's right. That's right. Yeah. I, uh, and I'm a classic weather weenie. I, I, fourth grade, I, I, uh, I got a, a, a little book on weather. I read it probably about 10 times during my fourth, fourth grade year. And I said, I'm hooked. I'm going to be a meteorologist. I'm going to be a weatherman when I, when I, when I, you know, when I get older, you know, so, uh, and so again, I was born and raised on a farm in Indiana. And, um, so I understood the weather. I understood the snow, tornadoes, uh, hail, all those calamities because we were on a farm. So, you know, we got ripped up by strong winds and hail. And, and I can't tell you how many times I remember blizzards, you know, seeing, uh, you know, land blizzards uh, setting up across uh, flat, the flatlands of Indiana. Yeah. You know, and uh, it, it's interesting because I, I, when I do talks all the time and you know, I talk about my story, you know, I say, I think if you lined up 10 meteorologists, I would say seven out of 10 knew they wanted to be a meteorologist since before middle school. I think that's probably yeah. fair to say. And, and you're certainly one of them. You said fourth grade. So that'd be elementary school. Um, you know, when you, when you went to Purdue, you know, I, I always like to ask this question too, because for myself, I didn't know anybody who was interested in weather until I went to college. I went to Rutgers. Was that the same for you? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, yeah. It's the same. I almost feel, I almost felt like a freak because <laughs> I remember challenging my middle school teacher. Uh, he was teaching through and he says, what are we going to talk? I asked him, what are we going to talk about weather? He says, we're going to do it, you know, a couple of weeks. He spent one day on weather. You That's know? it. I mean, God. and I was so upset, you know, yeah. so, uh, I, you know, I didn't, I didn't mind dissecting frogs and earthworms and stuff like that, you know, but gee, you know, no, you know, one day on weather, boy, I was upset. Now, th- when you go to college, you real you find out that there's, e- there's other people that had maybe a week of weather or like, and there's uh, there's a uh, high school in, um, in, in, in uh, somewhere in, in, used to be in uh, somewhere in Southern New Jersey or Northern Maryland, where they actually had a weather course in high school, boy. I, I would have probably told my parents to move. So just so I could take that course, you know, but, uh, but, you know, as a kid growing up, you, you create your own opportunities. You, I, I watched the weather. So I kept track of the weather uh, almost every day. I had my own weather station. I had an anemometer wind vane, but I was, you know, I was a, a farm boy. And so we didn't have a lot of money. So I made most of my weather yeah. instruments. And so, you know, and I learned uh, to, to use that to help, Help understand the weather. You know, I, I I got two things to say. One, Dan, you might be upset or jealous at me. I actually also had a high school class of meteorology. Oh my word! In New Jersey, we had a whole semester, and it was great. Well, it was actually it was a blessing and a curse. It was great because you know you learned everything about weather, and it was an easy A. But right. everybody else knew you were interested in weather, so they liked to pick at your brain a lot and see what you were thinking. You know doing some homework with Joe. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? But anyway, so, so the second thing is, you know, it's like you said, you kind of, the great thing about weather is you can kind of make your own opportunities with it because weather is everywhere. Right. But you know, for, for it, especially for, well, let's put it this way for someone like me, right. I was born, Dan, I was born in 1991. So I know you were 15 years into AccuWeather by that point, Right. but I did grow up with the internet for a lot of this time. So I was able, what, you know, and I used to watch AccuWeather, Listen, the AccuWeather videos, articles back in the 2000s, you know, with um, some of your, you know, past and current coworkers, um, we're, we're I've probably seen you before too. You know, I was 14, 15, 16 years old. But, you know, when you think about, um, you know, the access to weather now compared to where you were, you know, how do you just kind of like reflect upon it? Like, do you, do you, 
did you appreciate the time that, that you were in in order to observe your own weather? Would you have liked to be able to have access to unlimited YouTube videos? Just kind of curious your thought. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I, again, when I, when, I, when I was growing up, there was no internet. Um, and you watch, the, you watch the weather on TV, you know, to get an idea what the weather is going to be. But uh, also you quickly, being on a farm, you quickly learned how to read the weather, just looking at the clouds. So I probably know more about cloud structure than probably the average Joe Schmo um, weather uh, meteorologist, just simply because I watched how the progression of the high clouds would show up and then the mid-level clouds. And then I would go to a library or, uh, or, or buy some books, you know, that taught me how to look at those, those clouds yeah. and how they, they reacted. Uh, another thing too is you, get, you develop that second sense of understanding what's coming your way as well. I still do. I'm an avid hiker, I do backpacking. And so when I'm out in, in, in the wild, whatever, I know how to read the weather now. I keep an eye on the sky, keep an eye on the wind. Uh, and that is so important, you know. So I, I wonder sometimes maybe people don't appreciate how to be out without having a, a laptop yeah. in front of you or, or an iPad or your cell phone to see what the weather's doing. So the one thing I wish I would have been able to have is radar. I yeah. hated that, that I could not see radar because I would go to the weather service office in Indianapolis yeah. and just to see the radar, you know, but I couldn't see it, you know, in, uh, you know, during a thunderstorm or something like that, you know. <laughs> did, did did you get the uh, DIFAX machine readouts when you were at the weather service back then? Yes, yes. <laughs> DIFAX was was very big um, when I was in college. In fact, um, changing the the paper, which was probably carcinogenic, and uh, <laughs> and then these little bands, you had to, you had to change these little bands on the actual DIFAX machine to that burned in the actual images, you know, so... Uh, and you would get satellite imagery that way, but they are so crude, you know, and um, but um, yeah. And so on top of that is just the progression of the computer models. You know, uh, you, you go from uh, these uh, very, very uh, poorly devised uh, computer models back in the uh, 60s and 70s. And then you see I've seen the progression of how modeling has taken place. And believe me, um, it's been fascinating, faster computers, and they're going to be even faster down the road as well. So we're yet to be, we're going to see even more surprise, I think, down the road so with respect to computers. Yeah, you know, I, I think weather's, I think if you ask most meteorologists, they would all say technology is a very good thing for business, but you can really pinpoint things with better modeling and satellites and everything. One more question before we, we go to break. How did you get involved in hurricane forecasting being a uh, Indiana farm boy? Well, I, I, uh, at Purdue, I took a couple of graduate classes in tropical meteorology. Uh, and one of my professors, uh, Dr. Dayton Vincent, actually worked on uh, two big uh, programs, GARP, and also uh, on, on the uh, program that actually dealt with seeding hurricanes. And so oh. uh, he was able to uh, talk about what he experienced and uh, talked about the theory and everything behind that. But it kind of got my my interest so that when I jumped to when I got uh, hired on at AccuWeather, AccuWeather forecasts all over the world. So uh, my biggest interest was the southern United States, the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean and the Atlantic. And I learned how to forecast in those areas uh, very, very quickly. But you know something? I still like tornadoes. So I did love forecasting out in the plains and yeah. uh, still love forecasting out across the Midwest. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, listen, it's the United States. There's always there's a weather climate or whatever for everybody there. But uh, very cool. All right. Well, we're going to take a break. Can't believe the first half's over already. But we're going to take a break. On the other hand, on the other half, I should say, we're going to talk about why it's going to be an active season. We'll talk a little bit more about New Jersey and the mid-Atlantic with hurricane season. And we have his New Jersey map. This is the Something in the Air podcast. <music> Welcome back, everybody, to the Something in the Air podcast. I'm meteorologist Joe Martucci. We have new episodes for you the first and third Wednesdays of every month. First Wednesday of the month, 
We are with uh, New Jersey State climatologist, Dr. Dave Robinson, my birthday buddy and weather dad. We just had our May birthday together here. And then uh, we have Dan here, Dan Kalowski. He's a hurricane expert at AccuWeather. And we're talking about the hurricane forecast for them. Dan, are you, are you, do you know Dave Robinson? Are you familiar with him? Not, no, I don't. No. Oh, okay. Well, I'm just curious. I know he likes to get it. He knows like everybody. So I just figured I'd throw it out there. But uh, all right. So let's talk about, let's go back into the hurricane forecast here. Um, an active season expected at least at or above the average here. Uh, we touched a little bit about why it's an active season. You mentioned um, uh, a lack of El Nino. We talked about warm waters. Could you elaborate on that a little bit more than if there's any other factors that went into your mind when crafting this forecast? Yeah, uh, again, the warm water, what the warm water does is it, it allows the uh, surface pressures across the Atlantic to be lower than, than normal. So when you look at uh, computer projections, climate models that go out several months, you begin to see a, a pattern at uh, the, the surface pressures across the Atlantic uh, and the Caribbean, the Gulf of Mexico included, um, lower than normal as far as surface pressure concern. And as we talked about earlier, um, we're in a La Nina pattern which basically um, causes the upper level wind flow um, to be more west to east across the United States. Uh, during El Ninos, those westerlies tend to dip down into the, into the uh, Gulf of Mexico, Caribbean, and Atlantic more frequently. They dip down anyhow, you know, so there's nothing, there's, it doesn't, it's not as if the winds stay north of the Caribbean. It's just the fact you don't see as much of that westerly flow uh, in those areas. And what that does is when you have less winds dipping down those we less westerlies, uh, you have less wind shear. Uh, wind shear basically is, is basically a vertical profile of the atmosphere in which you look at the lower levels of the atmosphere and the upper levels. When those wind directions are at different level or at, at different directions, and also the wind speeds are different, or especially in the upper levels that they're stronger, um, those, that creates very un, uh, unfavorable conditions when that shear is there. And as I said earlier, what, what happens in strong shear is you have this column of cloud developing in, in these uh, groups of thunderstorms. And in strong shear, the thunderstorms will tilt uh, in one direction, usually to the east or northeast. And if you, if, if the, I like to use the idea of a spinning top. When you have a spinning top, if that spinning top is straight up and down, you can think of the hurricane the same way. There's no shear, but when there's shear on the top, or you know, or like you're pushing on that uh, a spinning top, it's tilted. And if you've ever pushed a a spinning top, it'll become very, very uh, discombobulated and will eventually fall apart or or, right. or stop spinning. Whereas if it's straight up and down, uh, it'll 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 stay in a steady a steady state for a much longer period of time. So this year. Again, we have we have we're going to see probably less shear than normal, and that favors tropical development. Another thing we look at is the weather across the Indian Ocean and into Africa. And what's why do we look there? Because the um, seeds of tropical development uh, develop in that general area. So if we see a lot of activity uh, in the Indian Indian Ocean. Uh, those little storm systems will work their way across uh, Africa. They tend to develop or intensify uh, over the eastern part of Africa in what we call the um, uh, Ethiopian highlands. And this creates almost like what we have like in, 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 in the uh, United States in the Lee of the Rockies. You have these storms developing. Well, the same thing happens in Africa. And these tend to then migrate westward and they become our tropical waves. And, and if you follow the weather quite uh, substantially in the tropics, you know that tropical waves are the seeds or basically the forerunners yeah. of organized tropical features, tropical storms, and eventually hurricanes. So the idea is the more tropical waves or the more storminess there is across Africa, the more likely you're gonna see a lot more activity. So the other parameter we'll be looking at over the next couple of months is rainfall, like in Ghana and in Sierra Leone and some of these Southwest African countries, whenever the rainfall is, is near or above normal, then you know you've got a pattern that's gonna be favorable for, uh, for storms to come off the coast and more frequently. So what you wanna see is 
uh, you know, somewhere between uh, 45 to maybe 65 tropical waves across here. If you're closer to the 65 tropical waves, then you're, you know you've got a very, very active season. It's like anything else. The more, the more things, the more features you have, the more likely you're going to have tropical development. Yeah. One area that we look at, and I'm sure a lot of meteorologists that are listening to this know this very well, is we look at what is called the main developmental region. That's an area roughly from 20 west to about 85 or so west, 10 north uh, to 10, or, uh, 10 north to 20 north uh, latitude. And uh, that rectangular box, if we can understand what the weather is going to be like there in August, September, and October on average, that'll give us a really good sense as to what kind of a, uh, a season we're going to have. Because 85% of all tropical development has its origin in that rectangular box, again, right. that we call the main developmental region. Good. And, and, you know, for New Jersey itself, anything specific you could tell us about, and maybe not New Jersey, but the mid-Atlantic as we go into hurricane season? Yeah, the one thing we're looking at right now is the strength, the orientation, and the, lo and the, loca the, the center of, of an uh, area of high pressure in the Atlanta. We call that the Bermuda Azores High. It's yep. a big, uh, generally oval-shaped area of high pressure out there. And the thing we look at is what is happening in the westerlies this time of the year. Well. If you've been following the weather closely the last, you know, several weeks, we've had these big outbreaks of unusually cold weather. Yeah. And, you know, people saying, where's our spring? You know, <laughs> now we got to 80 or so, what, 80 or 82 degrees a day in New Jersey today. So today was yeah. a fantastic day. But watch what happens the next couple of days here now. It's going to go downhill. We're going to be, you know, below normal highs, about 60 to 65 this time of the year in New Jersey. And, uh we're going to be lucky we get out of the fifties, uh, you know, as we get into the weekend or the latter part, yeah, weekend and into early next week. What that does is that causes the westerlies to, to, to sink a little bit across the Northern United States and, and into the Eastern United States, forcing that Bermuda Azores high to be a little bit further South. And then, if, and then all you need is for that high to extend Westward uh, into like the Southeast United States or Northern Gulf of Mexico and Voila, you have what we've seen over the last seven years. That is that Bermuda Azores High has been dominant, uh, extending its influence all the way in the southeast United States and northern Gulf of Mexico. What that does, it takes most of the storms into the Caribbean or the seeds of, of storms into the Caribbean, which will eventually work their way into the Gulf of Mexico. Long range forecasts are suggesting that that high is going to try to retreat westward as we get into the latter part of the season, like as we get into August and September, the most active time, uh, that high may try to retreat further east. If that happens, then the chances for um, that high to help guide storms into the eastern United States is going to increase. Again, it's, there's a lot of uncertainty there. My guess right now, since this season, cut upcoming season, looks very similar to last year and to 2008 and a few other um, key, uh, key years, uh, that we are probably going to see at least one or two storms that will either bring us rain or, you know, definitely have some impacts on New Jersey. Most of our impacts in New Jersey are from storms that have already made landfall. So people forget that a storm making landfall in the Gulf of Mexico can bring very heavy rainfall. We saw that last year yeah. with both Elsa. We saw that with especially with Ida. Yeah. And of course, people forget Henri. Henri was a hurricane, yeah. was a hurricane no. slammed into Rhode Island, for heaven's <laughs> sake, you know, then took a left turn, but it then brought a lot of heavy rain across that area. So the point is, we got we were impacted over the eastern United States by at least uh, actually count the two early season systems by uh, four or five storms last year. And so um, people don't remember the little ones, you know, don't remember the big one. People will remember Ida, but we had a lot of other uh, storms that caused some pretty good rain. So yeah. no doubt, I think uh, anyone living near the coast or along the coast or having interests along the coast, business or likewise, you better have your hurricane plan in place. Sure. I would not rule out to get a direct hit on the East Coast this year. No, you're right. And, and you know, to your point, Dan, it only takes one storm for it to be an active season in your area. You know, right. you look at some years back and, you know, it's not the most active season, but one storm hit Louisiana or Mississippi or New Jersey, whatever. 
and then people remember as an active season. So that, that was great, Dan. Yeah, we really appreciate this outlook on the hurricane season. Um, you know, we'll, we'll check back in and see what's going on as we go in deeper into the season. Hopefully we're going to stay calm here in New Jersey. Uh, and speaking of New Jersey, it is time for our New Jersey North, South, maybe Central. I haven't looked at your map yet. We got some thumbs ups from Stockton. So without further ado, I'm going to get into this email uh, here and let's see what you got. Um, well, hold on. I got to find it first. Let's see. I might need an assist here on the image. It might be here, actually. Here we go. Okay. Floating. Look at this. Dan, I'll tell you what. Stockton gave me the thumbs up. I give it a thumbs up, too. This, this is a good New Jersey map, Dan. We have, uh, for the people who are just listening and not viewing, you have northern New Jersey perfectly. You have Union, <laughs> Somerset, Hunterdon, in Central Jersey. That's fantastic. You have Burlington and Ocean in Central. I, I, if I had to disagree with you there, I, I would probably maybe cut those two counties in half and just draw a line there. But mm -hmm. then you get to Atlantic, Camden, Gloucester, uh, South Jersey. I think um, uh, you know I'm gonna I'm I'm a fan. Dan. I'm a fan of this map. Okay. Um, and you said you got down to Cape May a decent amount. So, you know, you're, you're at least familiar with New Jersey, um, in, oh, in its yeah. ways. Right. Yeah, I've been, I, in fact, I just flew out of uh, Newark, uh, just a, a couple of days ago. So, so I, okay. I've, yeah. You were, so you got, you know, the Northern part, you know, the Southern part and oh, yeah. you know, the central part based on this map. So this is oh, awesome. Yeah, definitely. Great. Hey, Dan, before we wrap up, um, just, you know, give us a plug. I, can we follow you on Twitter? Can we, you know, where can we get the hurricane forecast? Yeah, I think again, just, uh, just follow me on AccuWeather.com. Um, they'll, we do stories back and forth on there. And when there is storms brewing, uh, we're going to talk about them and especially AccuWeather is uh, very proactive. So if we see something out in the Atlantic or whatever, uh, that might, might turn into a something, um, certainly we'll, we'll be talking about it. So, uh, keep, uh, keep your focus on AccuWeather.com and you'll, you'll pretty much keep in touch with what the tropics are doing. Awesome. Great. Dan, thanks again so much for talking about your career, hurricane forecast, your life. I would hopefully, I'm sure we'll probably cross paths at some point, maybe at that, uh, on your shirt, that national tropical severe weather conference here, tropical weather conference in South Padre Island. That sounds nice yep. uh, during the spring. Sounds like a good place. But uh, yep. thanks to God, Dan. We appreciate the time and we'll talk to you soon. Okay, fine. Thanks a lot. All right, everybody. You're listening to the Something in the Air podcast brought to you by the Press of Atlantic City. Shout out to Stockton here for uh, making this all happen behind the scenes. We will be back with you the first Wednesday of next month here. We're going to talk about the month of May with New Jersey State Climatologist, Dr. Dave Robinson. Until then, everybody, take care, stay safe, and we will talk to you soon.